Although it may seem quiet, void, and possibly peaceful at first glance, this observation of the destruction of the Syrian town cannot fully provide 2020 vision to the destruction that the Syrian war as a whole has caused. How it has even gotten to this point of complete desolation still remains a mystery to many. Thankfully, however, by uh, scrambling, uh, uh, sifting through some of the rubble, I was able to come upon a book. This work, authored by an American foreign investigator, contains valuable information on this ever so saddening crisis. Its main contents include having an extensive chronicle of how the Syrian war came to be, how the civil war affects the civilians, and a brief chapter on how foreign countries play a role in this conflict. As curiosity as it is at its peak, let's flip to page one, i.e. where a brief explanation of how the Syrian war came to be resides. Al-Assad, the name too many Syrians have become accustomed to. This name first appeared with Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current day dictator, Bashar. Hafez's role in Syrian history is the establishment of a powerful authoritarian government. And by any means, Hafez would prove that he is in charge, with any voice opposition resulting in an immediate death penalty. A New York Times article depicts a moment when Hafez's irritation towards dissension was on full display, the setting being Hamas Syria, 1982. Hafez had gained intelligence about a rising insurgency from one of the police stations located in Hama. He followed suit by ordering four military companies to, and I quote, kill as many as seen in the town. The result, nearly 30,000 Syrian civilians were massacred. At age 60, Hafez is advised to start planning for a successor. And initially, it wasn't even supposed to be Bashar, the current aid dictator. It was to be Basil, his brother, his older brother. However, Bashar, uh, Basil had an untimely death at the age of 33. So Hafez requested Bashar come receive some military political training so that he could stand a chance at the presidential race. Bashar accepted, and through a presidential campaign in which he promised economic reform, a change into a democratic state, and a cleansing of the government's corruption, Hafe um, Bashar had swept all competition. And in the, president, uh, in the July of 2000, he had become the president of Syria. Through the first 11 years of his presidency, nothing, if anything at all, changed. And these uncut promises of reform did not bode well with the Syrian people. During the era of spring of 2011, a number of Syria's neighboring countries had successfully ousted their rulers and developed uh, de de democratic states, i.e. Tunisia, Yemen, and Egypt. Seeing the successes these countries had, the Syrian people had decided to break the silence of their unhappiness and a series of countrywide protests were enacted. Bashar, much like his father in the sense that he hated opposition, had sent his army to multiple Syrian cities to combat and brutalize the protesters, thinking that this attempt at uh, neutralizing the protests would work. Funny enough, this ended up being the shot heard around the world, world moment for the Syrian war. To Bashar's surprise, many, if not most of the protesters did not back down. Taken to arms, this, uh, a unionized party named the Free Syrian Army was the first of many uh, anti-regime factions to come into play, to come into existence. Easy to see, the people are sick of Bashar and his regime, and have shown willingness to combat it. The question remains, how are the civilians who don't participate affected by the war? To find that out, let's skim through the next chapter of our book. <coughs> to be quick and to the point, the civilians are being utterly slaughtered by the regime. It wouldn't matter if you had your own opinions for or against the protest. Bashar doesn't care. What he wants is the heads of the anti-regime terrorists and to control his people through fear. A case study by PBS has estimated that a total of 470,000 Syrian civilians have been killed. Roughly 10% of that total is children. Now, you may wonder, why is he so deliberately killing the civilians instead of diverting all firepower towards the anti-regime forces? The reason being, and his belief being, that if you kill the source, there is no opposition. And Bashar's way to silence the source may be the most disturbing sight the humanity has seen since the atrocities in the Holocaust by way of barrel bombs, chemical warfare, coordinated airstrikes, tanks, and ground forces, by way of, in combination, and these daily, these numerous daily scares, in combination with the destroyed homes, 
other people, and the fear of the children have, will have to live in these horrible situations, has given the Syrian people the only realistic out of the situation, to turn into refugees. The life of a refugee consists of daily starvation, cotton mouth dehydration, depression, and all together a lifestyle that no one in the right mind wants. Sadly, however, according to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, nearly 6 million Syrian civilians have been forced to take this out. Imagine the life of an orphaned Syrian refugee, waking up in the dirt, in an unconditioned hut that provides little in the way of comfort, going outside, seeing hundreds, no, thousands of your own people swallowed in their own disparity, and then to come to their own, your own realization that you're alone. There's no one there to comfort, give you happiness, or any sense of relief in this horrible situation. And then to come into the main portion of your day, walking. Walk into a place that you never call home. The life these people have to live is a life no one should even consider living. We're at the gates of the final chapter, which to help remember is a brief explanation of how foreign countries play a role in this conflict. No reason to hesitate. Let's thumb through the rest of the book and find out. Barack Obama, but many can be seen as idle with decision making about foreign issues. I won't fault Obama, however, since this foreign activity has been a U.S. trend, has been a trend of U.S. leaders since the late 1990s. I'd like to mention a quote through Huffington Post, which talks about these leaders. And I quote, they believe genocide was wrong, but they were not prepared to invest the military, financial, diplomatic, and domestic political capital needed to stop it. I believe this quote still stands today as how America feels towards the foreign issues. And although we may aid the, the Syrian um, the anti-regime forces, we have not put real American for, uh, ground forces on against the regime yet. The reason being, getting in a proxy war with Russia and Iran. And in this day and age, a proxy war could evolve into many other things. And with how easy nuclear missiles are for these advanced countries to make, I feel it is one to avoid. However, it's almost impossible to just sit back and watch and see all the stuff that's happening in Syria. We have successfully reached the ending of this book. Let's recap an epilogue and find out all that we've learned today. In the beginning chapter, in the beginning chapter, we were given an in-depth inspection of how the Syrian war came to be. The next chapter hopefully assisted our understanding of how the, the civilians are affected by the war. And in the final portion of this chronicle, we, we learned about how foreign countries play a role in this conflict. To conclude, this war is the worst humanitarian crisis to grace the earth in my lifetime. And how, this, and how this issue will resolve itself is the greatest mystery of the 21st century. My part in solving this mystery was to provide a synopsis of this issue to you all, hoping that it piqued your interest and maybe you'll put it in your own hands to save the Syrian people. Thank you.